anything that's off limits? I'm going to say no. If I talk about steroids, is that off limits? No. Okay. Um, I'm not going to be talking about political stuff. Oh, but... <laughs> This is still very much a health and fitness podcast. Oh man, you'd be speaking to the wrong person anyways. Yeah. Then nothing about polit politics. So all right, I'm gonna start the time. Mate, was you know, I think we've had this conversation before about uh, your name. Funnily enough, now it was very intuitive to me um, when I saw. Well, I've been I've been introduced to you before seeing your name written down anywhere, right? So I already know your name is Mate. See your name in the way it's spelled. I'm naturally just probably going to say Mate, but we how many times, um, you know, did we see you uh, go up on stage, for example? The announcer calls out your name, and we had I don't know a dozen different like renditions of uh, your name. I mean, how how often? Uh, do people get that wrong? I mean, if I could get a pound for every time somebody got my my name wrong, I probably I probably have maybe uh, a couple of thousand pounds in the bank right now. Wow, probably. Wow, but I mean, I've met a lot of people obviously through through my my job, but also because I'm I'm a bit of a social butterfly. At least I used to be. So I guess yeah, people got my name wrong a lot, but I don't I don't mind it so much. It's okay. Fair, fair. So for a lot of us, um, we haven't done this in uh, since like 2021 and 2022, maybe I'm not too sure. It has been like a year and a half since we last done an episode together. Since I've really been doing episodes, so we've probably got a little bit to catch up on um, for anybody out there. Uh, who's maybe just tuning in now? Um, the first, uh, the first round of uh, Confessions of a Personal Trainer episodes did feature Mate heavily, um, and uh, he was a regular guest that we kind of checked in with to see how it was going. And you were competing at the time; that was kind of like um, the the last dance that was happening at the time. Uh, although we don't know, we'll find out in this episode what's going to, kind of going on with that. But uh, it's been a while since we've kind of caught up with you. Uh, have you been training, Mate? Yes, <laughs> that's, that's the short answer. That's the boring answer. But I think for sure my training's changed a lot. Uh, it's a lot more about convenience now, whereas before we see our training for bodybuilding. So I was very much hell bent on okay, I've got to train four or five times a week. Got to make sure I hit all body parts. Uh, got to make sure I get enough protein in. I wasn't doing much cardio unless I was preparing for a show or getting close to a show, then I'll be doing more cardio then. But I am still training, but it's definitely very, very different. Um, I would say that my training is a lot closer to the type of training I would give a client. So if, I, if I'm seeing someone maybe two or three times a week, Chances are it's going to be full body because they only come in a couple of times a week. And that's over time, that's what I've learned works best for the vast majority of people. So, and the reason I say that works best is I'm not going to go into like the, I guess the, the long winded version of like why it's best not to follow a bodybuilding style program. Oh, just, just, just for context, because uh, people might be watching right now who uh, don't quite know what a uh, bodybuilding program looks like. What did that look like for you? Well, funny enough, I mean, if we're going to go into what the more orthodox style of bodybuilding program looks like, it's more of a chest day, back day, leg day, shoulders, arms, stuff like that. But I mean, we've worked together for a long time and I appreciate people might not know what your training style has turned into over time. It might have started with like more of a chest day, back day, but then that kind of transforms into combinations. So it could be like quads and chest, uh, hamstrings and back. So it's always a combination. So I found that I was doing two body parts on, on each training session, but that were maybe opposing muscles or just muscles that weren't necessarily going to get taxed in the same way. So Yeah, I well, I mean, I'll, I guess I'm... 
qualified to comment on that as I was writing you don't the program. Want to the program, so you know. <laughs> but just for the context for the audience, you know, the the, the methodology behind that is basically focused on uh, non-interference. So you're picking uh, two muscle groups that don't necessarily interfere with each other. And by training more than one muscle group in a day, you're creating an opportunity to train that muscle group more than once in a week. So you're not then having to wait seven days before the next round. You're recovering quick enough to maybe do it uh, a leg day uh, twice because you're focusing on quads one day, hamstrings another day. Um, so the muscles are getting like a, a little bit more of a, a faster stimulus. Um, but yeah, uh, our, our aim definitely was more focused around basically getting your muscles bigger um, making them more defined um, and it was less to do and it was quite taxing because you had to put so much time effort um, and volume that went into doing that work and obviously that comes with the sacrifices that uh, you were making as a uh, as a younger man with uh, no wife no children I know you had a girlfriend at the time who is your now wife Christine um, but it was obviously very different when we started and so, yeah, to to let you continue, um, where has it gone to now? So now I train when I can. Well, I train when I can. I don't know if that's a fair statement. I could definitely train more often, but because I've got, I've got two young kids, I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old, I'm very much focused on them and spending time with them. And before them, that would have been the time that I spent training. So when Christine was, was my girlfriend and even when she was my wife early on when we didn't have kids, it was okay if I, if I wanted to head out to the gym for a couple of hours, you know, after work. Because I spent, I spent my time with her anyways. Mm. But now, me being at the gym for a couple of hours after, after work, what that means for her is she's along with the kids dealing with them. And I know that's a, that's a stress for her sometimes or a lot of the time. You know, kids are demanding. They, they just are. That's what it is. <laughs> so... For me, it's super important that I'm involved in, in their life. I want to be present as much as possible. I want to read bedtime stories. I've been, you know, I change nappies. I'm very, I'm very hands-on for that. And I appreciate that's not, that's not everyone, but uh, for me, that's super, super important. And so when my first child was born, for me, it was more important that I spend that time with her, even if it meant that I'm not going to the gym, like I was okay with that. Or... If um, if I was putting her to sleep and uh, I knew that, I don't know, maybe Christine was, was going to bed early, then maybe I might make the time to go to the gym. But by then, I was a little bit, because kids are so demanding, I'd be pretty tired. I'm like, oh, do you know what? Maybe I'll skip the gym today. It's not a big deal. There was also the element that I wasn't preparing for shows anymore. So the goal was different. Now I was just trying to maintain as opposed to, oh, I'm trying to build as much muscle as possible. So I find that my training changed because because I'm not trying to put on any more muscle. And um, generally speaking, I think you'll agree that it's a much easier process to maintain the muscle you already have than building. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's interesting because um, it does make me think you've, you've not done the bodybuilding style training for how long now? Probably the best part of two years now almost two years wow okay so uh from my understanding of things two years is quite a significant period of time when we're talking about sort of changing somebody's body composition um we won't get in too much into 12 week transformations and why that's like a misleading timeline but two years actually is a very significant period of time for somebody's body to change uh now since kind of moving away from the bodybuilding style training and maybe moving more into what's become more practical for you. Have you noticed a change in your physique uh, in terms of how you look, how you perform, how you feel? 100%. I think there's been, there's been different phases. So there were times where I was training very little, maybe once, twice a month. And there were other periods where I was training maybe three times a week, sometimes four times. So and when I say training, it's been a combination of things. So part of my current job, so I'm head coach for, for Orange Theory Fitness, it's kind of like boutique, uh, boutique fitness, a boutique studio where essentially it's class, classes basis. So it's group exercise, high intensity, 
And um, so part of my role is to take those classes with members. And that's fine. But because my previous training was so heavily focused on strength training and very little cardio, now doing those classes is kind of flipped on its head. I'm doing a lot more cardio and a lot less resistance training. Even though there is resist resistance training in the class, it's just not heavy enough compared to what I was doing previously in the bodybuilding style training mm -hmm. because I had more time. So if you've got two hours at the gym, uh, you've got more time to rest, therefore you can lift heavier because you've had more time to rest between sets. Um, in a classroom kind of setting, so in a class setting, you don't have that kind of time. So time is really the issue. Uh, it's not so much that they aren't heavy weights because they are, but if you've only got six minutes to do three exercises, the rest periods are going to be maybe 30 seconds at best. So you tend to work pretty fast. And that means that the weights are going to be fairly low. Not an issue, but I just find out my training changed quite a bit. Sorry, tell me again what the question was. <laughs> That's okay. The question is more around, you know, two years of not doing that level of volume, that level of intensity with the bodybuilding training program, then now having to transition to, you know, like uh, an inconsistent sort of training schedule where sometimes you're training once, sometimes you're training four times in a week, sometimes you're not training at all. Uh, so, and some of the training that you are doing isn't necessarily geared towards building all your muscles. Um, have you noticed any significant changes in your sort of uh, your muscularity, your performance from the time you were like full tilt going at bodybuilding versus now where it's kind of, you know, not quite as um, full on as what you were doing two years ago? For sure. I would say the most significant difference is, well, for one, I'm a lot less muscular because I was so heavily focused on building as much muscle as possible when I was training for competitions. Um, so I've lost, I've lost a lot of muscle. That's, that's 100%. How much, how much muscle would you say you've lost? It's hard to tell because like at the, at the peak of say an off season, I think my highest weight was about 86 kilos. Right. Um, now I've weighed myself, I think a couple of days ago and I'm 77. Wow. So almost 10 kilos almost lighter. 10 kilos. Wow. So I would say some of that is going to be body fat. I'm definitely leaner than when I was in at the peak of an off season. But definitely lost, oh, maybe three or four, maybe three kilos of muscle, which is, which is a lot. Okay. It's a lot. And I mean, I can see it. Like when I look in the mirror, like my arms are smaller, my chest is smaller, my legs are a bit smaller. So, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, what I would say is on the, on the other side of that, I'm definitely, I guess, fitter. Like I'm, I can run a 10K fairly easily because I'm also taking those classes at Orange Theory. Uh, I'm faster. I find that uh, I recover faster from like working sets when I'm lifting weights. So like cardiovascularly, in terms of my endurance, I'm definitely fitter than I was when I was just doing bodybuilding. So I'd say, I'd say overall, am I like an overall fitter person? I'd say yes, I'm just less muscular. Because for sure, when I was weighing 86 kilos, Running a 10K, I could do it, but it would have been pretty tough. Tell me how you, how you felt as a, as a, as a, you know, approximately 85 kilo bodybuilder, um, you know, relative to how you're feeling now as a 77 kilo, um, uh, fit dad. Yeah, I would say probably the primary difference is when I was 86 kilos, I felt really strong. I was definitely, I could lift the heaviest weights I've ever lifted in my life. Any lift you can think of, deadlift, squat. Give me, give me an example. What was, your, what was your sort of squat weight that you would uh, do? I was lifting and at the time. I remember, I remember seeing the numbers because you, when you gave me the training program, you were working off percentages of a one rep max. So we had to test what my, what my best lift is for one rep on the squat, on the deadlift, on the bench press. So I did those lifts. And then working off percentage, you said, okay, it's got to be 80% of your one rep max for reps. So I was, I was squatting 140 kilos for reps on the barbell back squat. 
Wow. And it was full depth. On on the deadlifts, same thing. I was doing 160 for reps. No problem. All the way down, resting the weights. So I felt really strong. But uh, for sure. But yeah, if you'd asked me to run a 10K, I would have struggled. And how would you, how would you do now um, squatting 140 kilos? I might do one rep. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could do one, maybe, maybe two reps. Um, deadlift, same thing. Saying that, I've been training a lot more recently because I've got a training partner, which helps a lot. Okay. Just someone to say, hey, are you coming to the gym today? Uh, because if it were entirely up to me, I might just, I might skip it. That's actually quite an interesting um, thought. The When you were doing the bodybuilding stuff, obviously you had somebody writing the programs, uh, a coach that you were able to communicate with, even if it was remotely. Um, so you weren't entirely on your own, but you were doing the gym sessions by yourself at the time? Sure. Yeah. And now having a training partner, although it's quite recent, you know, how would you sort of compare those two experiences and, and what was kind of like, how was it for you just kind of being a more of a solo person in the gym following the training program versus now where you've maybe got a, a training partner that you're doing the workouts with? Yeah, I think when I first, when I first started training for, for bodybuilding, because I was so heavily focused on the goal, on the outcome, hey, I've got to get on stage. I've got to build as much muscle as possible. I've got to get as as strong as possible. I mean, I guess because I felt like there was a correlation between how much muscle you have and how much you can lift. So I felt, okay, I've got to get strong. The training has got to be hard. And if I don't have someone with me, that's not a big deal because I know what the goal is and I just got to get the job done. So in a weird way, for me at the time, my... How can I say this? I think my... My biggest, um, I guess my training partner was my logbook. I think that's, that's, how, that's the best way I can put it. So when I first discovered that I could write things down and I could write down, okay, how many sets I did, how many reps I did, how much weight I lifted, how I felt on the day, did anything hurt? And then the following week, I'd look back on what I did and say, okay, well, I've got to do at least this much. And that motivated me. So that was a, like sort of weird. I don't know if, I don't know if I can call it intrinsic, but that pushed me to train hard and I didn't need somebody with me because I was almost competing with myself last week. So that worked really well. I think also at the time I trained with a couple of people and what I found is if we are, if we're not roughly training at the same intensity, for me it reduces the effectiveness of my training. Like it's just not as enjoyable because I'm either taking longer breaks because the other person is tired or or the other person is way stronger and we have to keep changing plates back and forth. Um, so I just found that just training by myself is more convenient for one thing. But uh, also I think to do bodybuilding properly, I think you have to be a little bit crazy. Oh yeah? You have to be a bit, a bit of an oddball. I say that because I realize now, even when I train with the weights that aren't, that aren't as high as they were back then, I'm still pretty intense. Like I'm doing a bodyweight squat and I'm still very intense about everything. Like, because I'm very aware of what's going on with my body. So I feel like what's happening with my hips, with my knees, am I breathing right? Because over time, I've done so many of those reps. What, what I'm trying to do is replicate the exact same rep, whether there's no weight or whether there's a barbell on my back. I want my squat to look exactly the same, just for quality assurance purposes. So that's kind of how, that's kind of how I look at that, like back then. Um, now you asked me about like my training now and why you know, what's made it different with a training partner, I would say that now, because I'm not training towards a bodybuilding competition, I don't have like a specific goal, something that really drives me. Um, having a friend to go with, that drives me. Not letting that person down or just wanting to hang out. Because um, my training partner is a really, really cool person and I like to hang out with her. So even though we're at a different stage of our journeys, mm. I still appreciate just hanging out and just training, even if it's not optimal. I'm moving, so it's not a big deal. I'm doing something that I wouldn't have otherwise done if it weren't for the fact that she messaged me to say, hey, 
Do you want to show it today? Wow. So it's really, you know, the you having that experience and uh, kind of saying, okay, training with a partner is is, is basically made it enjoyable um, and you're more likely to do it as a result. Would you say that also extends to the role that you play with Orange Theory? Um, you know, if you were to kind of describe that experience for not just you, but for the the people that come along and, and do the workouts, um, do you feel like they're experiencing the same thing as you're experiencing when you're training with a training partner? I would say yes, for sure. I think a big part of what works at Orange Theory is the community aspect. Um, not everybody looks for that when they first join. Uh, most people come because they have some kind of pain points. They want to either lose weight or they've got diabetes or they're trying to have a baby. There is always some kind of a reason. Uh, and most of the time, it's not because they're trying to make friends. They're just trying to get a result, which is fair. But I find that that just gets people through the door. But what keeps them is making connections with the people around them. They make friends. Mm. And I find that's not that's not always an easy thing to do with with strangers. Like, okay, we're all doing this workout together, but... It's still a little bit like, well, you're doing your thing, I'm doing my thing. But because I work there, I can reach out to, to the members and say, hey, do you know what? let's work out together. Why not? And they appreciate that. They appreciate having me in the room. I'm kind of the, the hype man. You know, I make noise. Come on, guys, let's go. And they're like, yeah, they like seeing me there. So um, it's definitely a different dynamic because usually I'm telling them what to do. Whereas when I'm taking the class, we're in the trenches together. Like, I know what you're feeling right now. I know this is hard. You can do this. So when they see me sweating, they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, oh, now you know what that feels like. Okay, so what do you think it is about fitness that brings people together? What a question. <laughs> I think... I think part of it is, at least from my experience at Orange Theory, people people walk into the building and usually they feel they feel nervous, they feel anxious, especially if they've, they've not got much experience with with fitness, and they think they're going to look stupid. They think everyone's going to look at them and think this is ridiculous. Why are you even here? You don't look like you work out. But once they walk into the room and realize, hey. Like, no one actually knows what they're doing here. That's why we're here. We're, we're looking for a coach to tell us what to do because we don't know. And um, I find that once they realize, oh, everyone else is in, the, is in the same boat as me, all of a sudden, the anxiety comes down. Um, I hope that I help to do that as well when I do kind of like a little induction. Just say, hey, don't worry, I'm going to look after you. You're going to be fine. I'm going to lead you through the workout. Um... But yeah, I think what brings people together is just knowing that, hey, like nobody here has got it figured out, that like, we're all in the same boat. And even though my, my, I guess my, what we call a push is kind of like a, an uncomfortable feeling, my uncomfortable feeling might be different to you. So for me, a push effort um, might be I'm running at 10 miles per hour. And for you, a push effort might be, might be power walking at 3.5 miles per hour. We're both feeling the same thing. Our heart rates are elevated in the same way. But because we're a different place in our, in our journey, um, it doesn't look the same, but it feels the same. So I think it's quite accessible. And I think that's what, I think that's part of what brings people together, knowing that, hey, we're all feeling the same thing, even though we're not doing it the same. I'm working just as hard as you. And that, I think, I think that's part of what brings people together. That's quite, uh, that's amazing. I, I can see, you know, I've watched a lot of um, group exercise classes happen in, in various different facilities and uh, it's it's quite a, a, an anomaly that you get all these people that would have usually just gone onto the treadmill and been just walking on there for like 10 minutes and then maybe gone onto a rower and then maybe gone onto a cross trainer and then kind of like it's super boring and it makes sense as to why they didn't end up utilizing their gym membership that you know they pay for every single month because you're kind of just going on in there you're not really talking to anybody 
and there's a bunch of people around that are maybe making you feel a little bit insecure about yourself um and you know the, the weight section just seems very intimidating maybe there's people like lifting really heavy weights or slamming weights or maybe there is a, a social environment there that you're not included with so it kind of puts you off engaging with that environment further and when you know finish work and it's like do i really want to go and spend uh, an hour by myself doing stuff that is uncomfortable and boring um in an environment that doesn't make me feel very good about myself uh so i understand why people wouldn't necessarily you know want to do that on a regular basis so having that community plays such a huge role in the continuity in someone's fitness journey and it's very clear to see at this point uh, the role group fitness uh, plays and is going to play in sort of the the role the role in society so that's that's super positive if i was to if i was to flip it back to bodybuilding so bodybuilding in my experience, is kind of like that, but not like that at the same time. And when we also add in that element of social media, and there's definitely a conversation around social media and I suppose both community and isolation. Now, having been a um, fairly prevalent competitor at a point in time where uh, you weren't just some random guy in the gym. Yeah, you did win competitions. People did get familiar with you. Uh, you did build uh, a social media following for the back of your bodybuilding exploits. The what do you make of the the impact of bodybuilding, social media, and how it maybe contributes to community um, and people? people's feelings of enjoyment and inclusion when it comes to their fitness journey relative to what you've just described about orange theory. Yeah. To be frank, I've got mixed feelings. I've got mixed feelings about a bodybuilding and how high con contributes to, to the world as a whole. So I think there are some, some good parts like, you know, social media has definitely exposed bodybuilding in a way that, that could have never happened in the past. You know, like how I found out about bodybuilding, I used to read, you know, Flex Magazine, and I used to read articles on bodybuilding.com before, before social media kind of exploded in the way it did. So I think the good part is funny enough, even yesterday I was speaking to, I was speaking to, to, to an uncle of mine, and he said to me, oh, because he's aware that I used to bodybuild, he said, oh, um, do you know this guy, Samson Dowder? And I was like, you know, you know who Samson Dowder is? He said, yeah, and this guy, you know, Derek, you know, and Yvonne and Hadi. My uncle, you know, my, my uncle, I can't, how can I explain this in a way that, that makes sense? I mean, I just, I was blown away. He's over 50. And uh, he... He doesn't watch bodybuilding competitions, but he's interested in fitness. And somehow he's aware of the top bodybuilders in the world. Wow. Um, I don't know a lot of people who, who care unless you are interested in bodybuilding. It's a very niche um, kind of industry and like world. So I was blown away by that. And he just seems to be, you know, he doesn't bodybuild himself. He's just interested in working out. He works out five, six times a week just to stay healthy. But he is aware of these people. Um, I think, so the good side is exposure to, to fitness. I think it's good that people are aware that, Hey, you can do this fitness thing. You can go to the gym. It's good for you. I think the downside is that with bodybuilding, bodybuilding is the extreme side of fitness and people, a lot of people that are already a little afraid of walking into a gym because they think this is going to be really hard. Bodybuilding accentuates that. Oh. So, so I have to lift this much weight to like do the fitness thing. This is what I have to do. I don't want to do it. I have to eat chicken and rice and broccoli every day to get a result. I don't want to do that. So it's um, on the flip side, it's also a deterrent for a lot of people. 
because they think that this is what they have to do to get the, the outcome that they want. So I think the other side, that's, that's the negative side. And then I think um, also a lot of bodybuilders, and I have, I have to use their platform to then tell other people what they should do. So I, I find that a lot of people, want to, once they've trained for a little while, they start to figure things out. They're like, okay, well, I've been able to build a physique or improve my, my fitness by doing the things that I've done. So therefore it works. So then I can advise other people and tell them to do that thing and they'll get a result, which is not always the case. Um, what you've done for yourself might work for you, but it might not work for somebody else. And I only happen to know that because I'm a fitness professional. Um, but yes, a, a lot of bodybuilders might post online because they have a big following. They'll say, hey, this is hard on this. Not necessarily, they, you know, I don't, I don't think it's in a malicious way, but because they're showing everybody, this is what I'm doing and this is how I got a result. People then pick at this information and say, okay, so if I want to get a result, I have to do what this guy is doing. And I think that's also problematic quite oftentimes. Yeah, I can see that. Is um, I suppose that's true of 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 any of anything. You know, um, I got rich this way, and therefore you should do it too. And it's not necessarily evidence as to whether that particular way that things played out for that individual is scalable to every individual. Um, but certainly, everybody is going to have a bias to what's worked for them. I think. One of the one of the things I was maybe curious about from your perspective is um, the psychological impact, and and again, it stems from what you were talking about with Orange Theory, and you described such a such a positive experience for people coming through the door, and then you know starting to feel good about working out, and that with bodybuilding. Sometimes what I've observed is people have gotten into bodybuilding and actually started to feel worse about working out and worse about the uh, their fitness journey. Um, sometimes that might be as a result of, you know, comparing themselves with others uh, or even on the competition element. Certainly, you know, when we win, it's great. And when we don't win, it's not so great. And I, I remember being at quite a few competitions and like observing all the different competitors. Some of them had just come off the stage, not getting the result that they want uh, and, you know, feeling very sour about it. And then they've got, you know, all their sort of friends and family around them telling them that they were robbed and they were cheated. And so, uh it's it's a it, i think the the element that's really positive is it actually does bring people there's a lot of people that met each other through bodybuilding uh we had uh, a group of friends that you know all competed together um like fair enough everybody was working with me and that's how we connected but it, it created a group of friends that still exist to this day years later and that all know each other, that all support each other, that will still care about each other's fitness journeys. So certainly we can say bodybuilding does produce those outcomes. We see it all over the place. People connected through social media that didn't know each other, but they were followed each other on uh, Instagram and commented on each other's posts, on their update pictures, on their wins, on their losses, met each other at the shows, the expos. Uh, it, does, it definitely did bring people together, I think, uh, from that perspective, it's been it's been wonderful. Um, the combination of bodybuilding and social media, and the fact that your uncle knows who Samson Dada is, uh, is phenomenal. Um, but the other side of it is the feelings the the feelings of not being good enough. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I think you have to go into bodybuilding with a very healthy mind in the sense that it is, a, is a, it is a subjective sport at the end of the day. So, and I call it a sport. I know some people would argue that it's not, 
because it is an objective. So when you run a 100 meter sprint, uh, the winner is the person that ran it the fastest. That's the bottom line. And that's, that's not something you can argue with. You might argue with, oh, who, who was the, the millisecond faster? Maybe, if you couldn't quite figure that out. But with bodybuilding, you jump on stage and you have a bunch of judges. They look at you and say, this one looks better than this one. I think so. It's not you lifted the heaviest weights or you worked the hardest or you spent the most time at the gym. It's just, I think this one looks better than this one. And that, if you, you know, if you're going to place your self-worth on, on that judgment, then, then yeah, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot of disappointment because if you step up on stage and you happen to, it could have just been that on that day, somebody else looked better than you. It's not that you have a bad physique, but if you don't win and you feel like, okay, well, if I don't win, I'm a failure, that, that can bring up a lot of, of issues like down the line in terms of how you feel about yourself. So for sure, that's, that's, I think that's the darker side of bodybuilding. And um, again, for me, I feel quite fortunate in, in a couple of ways. For one, I feel like I went in because I didn't go in with the expectation that I was going to win. That was one thing. Uh, I just did it for fun to start with. And then it turned into something a bit more serious because I happened to be good at it. So I think a lot of people go into bodybuilding with the, with the expectation that if I train hard, I can win. And actually bodybuilding isn't that at all. I mean, working hard is part of it, but I'd say the vast, the biggest portion is mom and dad, your genetics. If you've got the right genetics, you can do extremely well in bodybuilding, even if you're not the hardest worker in the room. That's just a fact. I've seen it play out hundreds of times. Some people just have better genetics. They just look better. I'm not six foot five. I just wasn't born that way. And that's okay. You know, so am I... Am I going to be the best person to, to go to the NBA? Probably not. Does it mean I can never go to the NBA? I mean, I could work really hard. There are definitely players that are my height, but they have to work doubly hard. It's just a, an up, upward battle. So, yeah, I, f I find that with body, bodybuilding, that's really the main, I think that's the main issue when people go into it. Wow. There's, um, yeah, that's definitely, I think, uh, something that not everybody maybe takes into consideration because it's really hard to measure your genetics, how you know that, uh, you have the right genetics for bodybuilding. Um, how do you know that once you start lifting that you're going to respond very well to resistance training, um, there is something else there that we, we're not touching on, but. Well, maybe I'll get to that. Then you don't really you don't really know until you start, and then obviously it's opinion based, like you said. So you might talk to somebody, and uh, they might tell you, "Man, you you definitely got it." And then you know maybe you do a few shows, and the judges turn around and say, "Not really," or they'll start telling you, "You need to work on this, or you need to work on that." And you know those just are not body parts that you're very genetically strong in. Uh, and you're always kind of going up against people that that are pretty good in that um, in that area. So you know, it might be your, your shoulders, it might be your chest, it might be your quads. Um, it's a yeah, it's a difficult sport if we want to call it that to win. And even if you do have overly fantastic genetics uh, on that particular day depending on the agenda of the organization at that moment in time, um, you might not necessarily be the look that they're going for, even if you do actually look better than everybody else. So, yeah, it's, it's a very tricky thing to to win and do well in. Um, the getting caught up in comparisons, again, it's, you know, what are you comparing yourself against, I guess? But uh, you touched on something there. You what you you didn't mean to, but it, it inspired a thought. The darker side of bodybuilding. So 
you know, to that note, the average person who engages in fitness, who's trying to maybe lose a little bit of weight, who's maybe trying to feel better, who would hope to maybe look good in their holiday pictures, they don't necessarily take into consideration the use of performance-enhancing drugs, aka steroids. In bodybuilding, that's a different story. The two are quite synonymous with each other. And whilst we do have natural bodybuilding, for the most part, the inclusion of steroid use um, is, is prevalent across bodybuilding. You, as a bodybuilding competitor at a time, how did you feel about steroid use? Yeah, I think my my viewpoint was pretty much the the standard of what society thinks like steroids are and what they do. I was very I'm gonna use the word scared or scared of steroids of what they might they might do to me if I ever went down that road. Um but I think because I, because I was in it, like it, in terms of competing, I was competing with other people who, who did take steroids. I didn't have a negative stigma against it because I knew this is just part of the game. It's not something that I was willing to do, but I didn't feel like, oh, you're, you're taking steroids, you're, you're a bad person, or you must be, you must be aggressive, or you must be something wrong with you. How could you, how could you do, that, do that to yourself? Because clearly t- taking steroids is, is bad. Not only is it, it's, you know, it's, immoral it's wrong it's uh it's cheating because when you look at media as a whole whenever there's a story about performance and horse and drugs in you know, at the olympics or any kind of other sport big sport in big sports in general uh, it's a bad thing people get banned for for using steroids in competitions so i think as a whole steroids are seen pretty negatively and that's that was my that was my feeling but not towards the competitors themselves, but more towards the thing. It's like, okay, that's not something I should be doing. It's bad, it's wrong. But I, but I did feel like in bodybuilding, it was an okay thing to do. It, was just, it just wasn't something that I was willing to do at the time. So I decided to compete for the most part naturally. Um, and because I was able to beat a lot of guys that were taking steroids, without taking anything, I thought, well, I might as well just keep going in that direction. I don't need to take anything and I'm, I'm winning. So there's probably no point doing that currently. So that's, that's kind of how I felt. It certainly, it certainly was a, um, like, you know, you started off really strong, um, winning your first show. That was an amazing moment. Um, that I, I remember, um, and then yeah, continuing to to do well as a competitor over the next few years, large part being because you just had better genetics than ninety five percent of people out there, and of course nearer to the end, as the the category that you competed in started to change, the guys were getting bigger, they were getting more enhanced, so to speak. Um, it was getting harder for you to to keep up with the level of competition that was now being put forward. What is your what is your outlook on steroids now versus then? Yeah, I think now that I'm a little bit better educated, I still don't know a lot, but. So thanks to thanks to Google, thanks to the internet, there is there's a lot of information that is accessible to to you and I and to everybody now. Um, I think if you if you follow the right person, you know, doctors, scientists, they will tell you, okay, if you take this thing, this is how it can affect you. And I think if we go back twenty years ago, maybe even let's go with twenty years. If you go back twenty years ago, back then. It was a case of you go into the gym, you meet Jack, 
Jack has, you know, he deals some stuff. He's like, hey, you know, like, I want to be, I want to be as big as you, Jack. And Jack says, all right, take this. This is how many times you take it. This is how much you take. Crack on. And that was kind of it. Um, and because there was so little knowledge and information being shared, you just kind of did what the next person is, is doing. And it wasn't really a smart way to go about things. And thinking about it, it's actually really stupid. Um, because it could be that Jack is twice your size. It could be that he, he's been doing this for the past 10 or 20 years and he's worked his way up to this amount of drugs. And maybe you need, you need much less to get the desired effect, whatever the effect is that you want. So my viewpoint is that it can be done safely. I understand that there's a stigma against it, um, but this stigma is coming from, from a lot of myths, a lot of not knowing, a lot of misinformation. Um, but I think if you if you look a little bit deeper into into some of those drugs and what they do, I mean, in real terms, a lot of people are on are on drugs that are actually life enhancing. So TRT, for example. Now I appreciate your audience is probably more like more UK audience, but I'm speaking for like it, it, and even now. To be fair, I think it's becoming more mainstream in the UK. But TRT is essentially. Uh, testosterone replacement therapy so if your testosterone levels are lower than, than the average or lower than than what we'd like to see you can get a little bit more right you can go see a doctor and say hey doctor i'm not being so good they do some blood tests and you may see that your t levels are very low or maybe lower than the average of what they like to see um they might they might give you some some extra and a lot of men do feel better for it they feel more normal and that's perfectly fine. It's followed by a doctor, and that's not considered steroids, but it is. It's the exact same thing. It's testosterone. And there are lots of other drugs just like that that are, in fact, steroids, but just not labeled steroids. So I think it's just about, I think, for me, having a better understanding of what it is that, that you're taking. And once you have that understanding, you can then figure out, okay, this is how I need to do this in the smartest way possible to make sure that I'm healthy as possible. So for me, that's what, that's what it's really, that's what it boils down to. What is the, what is the line do you think for a person to consider taking steroids versus not taking steroids? So like a really obvious example of that is if you are I'm not going to mention the names because I don't want to get like sued for slander or anything. But if you are a top level bodybuilder uh, competing as a professional in the professional competitions um, at the Mr. Olympia, for example, which is like the Super Bowl of bodybuilding, then it's kind of a given that to be at that level, it's impossible uh, without the use of steroids. For sure. So we can say, okay, in that situation, um, assuming that the user has understood the risk, it's acceptable for them to be doing that um, all the way down to somebody coming into your studio um, at Orange Theory Fitness, just looking to participate in the classes, just looking to get a little bit fitter, maybe looking to lose a little bit of weight and again, maybe hopefully looking good in their holiday pictures. You know, At what point do we draw a line and say, okay, I understand that you would use that to you. That's probably not a good idea. And I'd recommend that you don't. I think when you say draw a line, I think the vast majority of people don't need to use steroids. And when I say the vast majority, I'm speaking really for I guess the people that are maybe, I'm going to say under, under 50. When I say steroids, I'm still, I'm still considering things like TRT, steroids, by the way. Um, but if you're, if you're Sally and you're, and you're 35 and you just want to look, look a little bit better and be a little bit leaner, uh, you want to have more energy, doing something like Orange Spirit Fitness is pretty much all you need to do, as well as maybe probably tidy up your diet and if you do those two things maybe get some quality sleep you're going to be fine 
you're going to get a very good result and you don't need to take anything else, not even supplements. I think there's an over-reliance on buying something to get a quick result. And I think this is how people, the people that are thinking about taking steroids, this is how they treat it. I want to get the quickest result possible and as I think they still want to work hard, but they think it's going to be an easier ride if it just takes something. So, and I, you know, I've done it in the past when I wanted to get really lean. Okay, can I can I take something? Can I take a supplement that's going to make me leaner? That's going to help me lose body fat around this area? Um, can I take something that's going to give me more energy? So we always think that there is something we can take that's going to help us get a result faster. But for the most part, the basics, the basics, do really 95% of the job. So, so I, I mean, when you said, you said, where, where do we draw the line? I think if you're looking to enhance your performance to compete, then that's on you. You can do your research and figure out whether that's, whether you're willing to take certain risks to achieve the result that you want. Uh, but if you're just trying to look good at the beach, you can do that without steroids for most people. Now, I think we've had this conversation in the past where if you happen to be someone that has particularly poor genetics and you've been training in a gym consistently for five years, your training has been on point and you still feel like you're getting mediocre results, then maybe, maybe it might be worth taking a little bit of testosterone. Just maybe. If you feel like, you know what, just my genetics are stacked, stacked against me on this one. Um... I'm doing all the right things, but I just need a boost. I need a leg up. Then maybe, but I guess you have to you have to weigh in your pros and cons. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that that individual is a unicorn. Almost every single person with uh, like mediocre bodybuilding genetics or genetics that like give them some sort of aesthetic advantage um, and they don't have that and they look very average or maybe below even then improving their muscularity uh, it is still possible to the point that they would be considered like you look pretty good for what you are without the use of of, of anything at all what happens in my experience is that they aren't actually ticking the boxes that they think that they're ticking. And I am saying that without judgment because I understand that they feel that they're working hard. Um, they are maybe looking around and saying, well, I'm doing all the things that these people are doing. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've learned about training. I've been reading things and I can go into the gym regularly and I'm eating X amount of protein. I'm doing all of these things. Often what tends to happen is, and I and I probably talk about this um, more than once now, is that it's that um, sort of effort reward cycle that occurs. Now, if I'm you, and quite frankly, if I'm me, because I do I put my hands up, I do have above average bodybuilding genetics. They're not as good as yours by any means. <laughs> but they're definitely better than the average person's. Uh, when we go and lift weights and we do training and we eat protein, we're seeing our outcomes a little bit faster. We're seeing a, a more pleasant image in the mirror and we're getting more positive uh, feedback from our external environment. People are giving us compliments. Um, people are like liking our stuff on social media. And I've worked with people who don't quite have those genetics and process for them is slower they don't get the external validation as quickly uh, they don't get the internal validation as quickly they don't see their strength increasing as quickly it takes longer but what they do is they compare it to somebody who's getting it faster so uh it sounds like you've um it sounds like you've had quite a journey so far what does the what does the future look like for you? Yeah, so, you know, we, you know, off, off mic had this conversation recently 
And um, I'd like to get back on stage. Hi. The 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 biggest bodybuilder competition in the world, Mr. Olympia, just went a couple of weeks ago. I watch it every year. I'm excited. I'm still very much a bodybuilding fan at heart. Um, and I'm very aware that for now I'm just riding the excitement because uh, this happens every year. I watch people get on stage. I get pumped. I get hyped. And I'm like, oh, man, yeah, I want to do this. But then, you know, the, then the excitement dies down. Reality sets in. Oh, but yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got a full-time job. I've got a wife, two kids all kinds of other life stresses, and sometimes things don't just pan out the way you want to. So what I want to do is have another go because really and truly, beyond the, hey, I'm just going to try this out for fun, the whole bodybuilding thing, then it became, oh, how far can I get? Okay, I'm an amateur for now. I'm winning amateur shows. That's great. Could I maybe turn pro? All right, so that was a goal, which I never... It never materialized. So I would have loved to do that. And if I can turn pro, could I maybe make it to the Olympia stage one day? You know, we've had that conversation a few times. You know, we we'll both, we'll both get excited just at the thought. Um, for me, that would be really cool. Both on a professional, I guess, level between you and I, because you were my coach for so long. But also on just a personal level, like I would love for you to just be, be there, sitting in the audience, like, that's my guy. I hope to get there. For me, that'd be really cool. It's certainly, um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, certainly a dream moment. It was, it was a dream moment when you um, became British champion uh, after after years of of trying. We didn't get there straight away. Um, it took a few tries. It took, you know. Um, building newer versions of yourself and it was a journey and it's always very rewarding when you, you know, go from uh, starting at the beginning. You don't necessarily, whilst we've talked about getting the reward straight away, some of the stuff that we achieved was not a reward straight away. There was lots of second places, um, lots of uh, us being the people like, we got cheated and we got robbed, um, standing around and all the rest of it and uh yeah the, these are truly amazing amazing moments that you know i definitely miss um and i'm very 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 grateful to have been part of um and yeah we'll we'll see what happens i guess in the future for sure uh, and that would be another truly amazing moment to you know uh see you at the the olympia stage um we we can say for certain you certainly have the genetic potential for it um and we've seen uh, some of our friends recently uh, do really well in that regard as well. So that's probably been added motivation to to make that happen. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Mate, we could talk for four ages and there's probably like a hundred more things that we can cover and, and talk about. And I'm definitely going to have you come down and do this again. Um because there's always so much to, so much value to extract and insight to extract from 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 your experience, your you know, which is really unique as somebody who's obviously done bodybuilding, who's you know just been a young guy, trying to to you know be in the gym and work out and get fitter to you know being a, a professional trainer and um, who's worked with you know individuals, who's worked in groups, who works with Orange Theory right now, and um, you know and there's so much experience there to to draw from. And uh, I want to thank you so much for, you know, uh, everything you've given us today. Um, I really, really, really appreciate you coming down. And I definitely, definitely look forward to the next time uh, we do this. Um, in the meantime, uh, where can where can people find you if they want to they want to reach out if they want to see your journey if they want to, uh, you know, compare themselves? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, I was. I guess, you know, in true podcast fashion, I, I was kind of expecting this would be like the the last thing that you'd say. But yeah, people can find me on Instagram. Primarily, it's at the Lean Muscle PT. So that's the that's the handle that I use right now. But if I'm honest, I don't post on it very much currently. So because you said earlier, you know, who are the people that I follow and things like that, I very much like to steer people. 
towards the people that I follow for some quality content. Um, the likes of Dr. Mike Israel. I watch his YouTube videos all the time. Very smart guy. Um, I love the way he breaks down difficult concepts to like, everybody can understand this guy and he's very funny. Well, if you like his humor. Um, for the ladies, you might want to follow Sohi Ali. Uh, I think it's Sohi Fit on Instagram. I could be wrong. But if you look up Sohi Lee, very smart woman, uh, very down to earth and you know breaks down a lot of things to need for nutrition. So for the ladies, that's a really good person to follow as well. And I think, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, well, um, amazing, amazing recommendations. Um, I'm a big fan of both of those individuals and probably be amazing one day if I was actually able to uh, get them onto the show and uh, sit down and, and interview them. Who knows it will happen in the future. Um, but thank you so much for that. And thank you for coming down. Looking forward to seeing you again and uh, hearing more about what's going on with you and your your training and all the rest of the insights. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you for having me.